Welcome to Jesus Changes Everything, a daily podcast dedicated to providing a fresh look at the ancient and glorious truth that Jesus not only reigns, but is busy about the business of bringing all things under subjection, that celebrates the wonder and the glory that he has been given all authority in heaven and on earth. One of the most frequent questions that I hear um, from both believers and non-believers alike is this, does God hear the prayers of the non-believer? And I have to explain every time that that's one of those questions where the right answer is a yes and a no. If by here do we mean is God aware of, of course God is aware of the prayers of the unbeliever. God's aware of everything. God's omniscient. There's nothing said that God doesn't know, nothing thought that God doesn't know. In fact, there's nothing thought that God hasn't planned to be thought from before all time. But does he hear in the sense that a father hears the cry of his child? And that answer is no, he does not. And when you consider that, when you enter into that reality, you begin to get a little bit of a taste of what it means to us, how important it is, how significant it is, how it reveals who God is when we remember as part of our proper theology that the God that we serve, the God that we love, the God that's redeemed us, he is, as the scripture describes him time and again, the God who hears. He is the God who hears. If you've ever, friends, been in that situation where you feel like your prayers do not pass through the ceiling of the room that you're in, That feeling is real. You're actually having the feeling, but it's also false. Your prayers, friends, don't travel from you up to heaven where God is. Because God is with you. He doesn't hear because you shout loud enough. He hears because he's right beside you. Have you ever been in those moments of heartache and anguish and uncertainty and fear? He has. Every single time. With you. And when we cry out, he hears. Now, does that mean that he is a celestial bellboy? Do we ring our bell and he comes running and does our bidding? Of course not. Of course not. He's not a tame lion. But it does mean that we're never alone. It does mean that he's right beside us. It does mean that we never have to fear that he doesn't know what we're going through. Tell him. How many times, friends, how many times have you been in the place where you're in that despair and you're in that uncertainty, you're in that anguish, and then it dawns on you, oh, my stars, what an idiot I am. Why haven't I prayed yet? Do you know why that thought came to you? It's because your Father in heaven watching you fret, watching your palms begin to sweat, being right beside you, just gently cleared his throat <clears throat> so that you would remember that you could cry out to him. We serve the God who hears. And by the way, he doesn't just hear us, friends, in our hardship. You understand that when we cry out to God with praise, 
He doesn't just hear it. He doesn't just say, well, yes, that's all true. He's not bored with our praise. He delights in it. He takes it in. He drinks it up. He rejoices in it. The scriptures say that God's throne is the praise of his people. It's what he sits upon. He inhabits the praises of his people. That's the God who hears. Now, I've got more good news for you. You know when you feel angry at him? You know when he feels distant to you? You know when you're frustrated? You know when he doesn't do your bidding and you want to shake your fist at him? He hears that too. And you may have many friends out there in the world, out there in the church, who are telling you, it's okay, God's a big God, he can take it. Yeah, that's not being a good friend. The only thing we should do when we're angry with God is not excuse our anger on the basis of its honesty. What we need to do is repent. But that, too, he hears. Lord, I'm struggling with anger. I'm struggling with frustration. I'm struggling with trusting you. Please, Father, cure me. Help me. Fix me. Let your spirit work in me. It is a shameful thing, Father. You are so good to me. You are so near to me. You're so tender. You've redeemed me. You've promised me. Lord, what is wrong with me that I would dare to utter or think a moment of complaint against you? Lord, forgive me. He hears that. He hears it all. He hears our petitions. He hears our praises. He hears our repentance. And he hears us when we thank him for hearing us. Have you ever had a hero sneak up on you? There's no question that I have. And what I love about that reality is that it actually is an encouragement to me because it's evidence to me of God's work in me. That is, it is a sign of my own sanctification. I want you to go back with me 30 years. I am a student in seminary. I have come to the place where my interest in theological matters is such that I'm a full-time seminary student. I work full-time for Ligonier Ministries. My father's uh, public uh, reception is taking off. And I'm moving in circles with some of the greatest theologians in the world. I start off at Reformed Theological Seminary, and I have my father as my systematics professor. I had Roger Nicole as a professor. I had Richard Pratt as my Old Testament professor. I had uh, Carl Henry as a visiting professor and John Gerstner as a visiting professor. And these guys were and should have been heroes to me. But they were heroes to me, to that part of me where knowledge puffs up. Meanwhile, I'm working at Ligonier. And my boss had been a hero to me when I was a kid. My boss had been a counselor at the church camp that I attended as a kid. So I had looked up to him then, and we were all part of the same team, the education department team, and also on the team was this hero that you've never heard of, Mike Batis. Mike wasn't a world-renowned theologian. Mike wasn't, uh, a, a, at that time, a published author. He is now. 
Uh, Mike wasn't a polemicist. He wasn't given to arguments. He was quiet. And he was gentle. And as long as he was quiet and gentle, he wasn't a hero to me. But as I got older and as God worked into me, I came to appreciate those qualities. And I came to look at my, and I remember this. I remember the significant role that Mike played in my life because one day I was at the office and Mike's oldest child was there visiting. Now, I had seen Mike's kids around at various ministry events and had always admired their character and their good behavior. And so I was striking up a conversation with this young man. He was probably fourth or fifth grade. And I said, hey, um, where do you go to school? And he said, oh, I go to Tottenham Academy. And I said, okay. And, and he left and I began to think, I thought, I'm pretty sure I know every Christian school in the city of Orlando. And I have never heard of Tottenham Academy. That's just weird. I wonder what that's about. Next time I saw Mike, I said, Mike, I asked your son. He said he goes to Tottenham Academy. Is there a new Christian school I'm not aware of? He just smiled and said, oh, uh, that's what we teach our children to say when people ask where they go to school. Because we homeschool them. I'd never heard of homeschooling until that point. And yet the moment he said that, I was already on board. Not because I was so enamored with homeschooling immediately, but because I thought to myself, if that's the kind of kid homeschooling can produce, that's what I want to do. And that's when I began to think, hey, this Mike Betis guy, he's a good dad. He's a thoughtful guy. Now, Mike and his precious wife, Mary, and Mary is a wonderful, wonderful woman as well. They have a little girl who's profoundly disabled, Jessica. And I also had the blessing of watching them care for her, which modeled for me how I wanted to care for my Shannon. And again, I saw the tenderness. I saw the gentleness. I saw the wisdom. I saw the humility. That's who Mike is. Now, I'm not going to ask you to track him down and tell him that he is a hero to me because Mike has been such a hero to me for so long and so powerfully, even though he didn't start out that way, that I haven't been able to keep from telling him. Every time I see him, I tell him. Every time I see him, I choke up and say, Mike, I, you know, I want to be like Mike. One of the most compelling evidences that I can think of about the ongoing impact of Gnosticism on the Christian church is our profoundly anemic understanding of the significance of the final resurrection. As we continue in our ongoing series on the Westminster Shorter Catechism, we turn today to question 38. In question 37, we looked at part two of a three-part series of questions wherein the Westminster divines were seeking to answer the question about the benefits that believers receive. The first question looked at what benefits do believers receive in this life. The question 37, what benefits do believers receive at their death? And for much of the evangelical church, that would have been the last question. But our fathers had the sense to ask this question, what benefits do believers receive from Christ at the resurrection? The answer we're given is this, at the resurrection, believers 
being raised up in glory, shall be openly acknowledged and acquitted in the day of judgment, and made perfectly blessed in the full enjoying of God to all eternity. These blessings, these gifts are those things which we will wait for between the time of our death and the time of the final return of Christ, the time of the resurrection of our bodies. But when that resurrection comes, these are the gifts that we will receive then. We will be raised up in glory. Now, friends, if you remember, I've done it many times, and I'm going to continue to do it. I have uh, my own sort of patented outline of the Bible that goes like this. Roman numeral 1, Genesis 1 and 2, creation. Roman numeral 2, Genesis 3, fall. Roman numeral 3, Genesis 4, through Revelation 22, trying to get back to Genesis 1 and 2, only better. In the same way that heaven is a place of wonder and the closeness of God and the absence of hardship and pain, so too was the garden like that. But the garden wasn't the end of what was supposed to happen with us or for us. If Adam and Eve had passed their test, they would have moved on to a state of glorification. And that's where we're going. We're going at the resurrection of Christ to where we would have gone if our first parents had not fallen from the estate wherein they were created. And we will be openly acknowledged and acquitted in the day of judgment. Oh, my stars, friends. Do you understand that? That public declaration of not guilty. Not guilty. Not guilty. R.C. Sproul, you're charged with the crime of harming your children by losing your temper. The judge declares you to be not guilty. R.C. Sproul Jr., you are judged, you are charged with the crime of having malice in your heart towards your brother without just cause. And you are found not guilty. Not only that, but those places, friends, where we have been sinned against will be acknowledged. Now, this is, again, a sure sign that we don't believe in the fullness of what is coming. We think that history stops when we die because we're so dissatisfied with this promise because we think that somehow, unless we are vindicated here and now, it doesn't really count. It's not really helpful. This end of days, day of judgment, vindication, it won't really satisfy us. But the truth is, it will. We will be satisfied. We will be vindicated. Every wrong thing that people have believed about you will be demonstrated to have been wrong. Every false rumor, every lie, every bit of it will be gone. That's something to look forward to. But the fullness of the promise is here that we will be perfectly blessed in the full enjoying of God to all eternity. You have heard me say, if you've been listening to this podcast for long, that the reason we cannot behold the glory of God is because it's too much. But in our glorified state, our capacity to take in 
what we see will expand. And I'm going to argue it's going to continue to expand. One of the ways that someone came up with to describe the reality of the biblical language of levels of rewards, great will be your reward in heaven. These ones will be least in the kingdom of heaven. And how we can understand these layers and yet avoid the the fear of disappointment is this way, that we say everyone in heaven will be full But some will be thimbles that are full, and some will be glasses that will be full, and some will be 50-gallon drums that will be full, and some will be swimming pools that are full. I believe that, but I also believe that everybody grows, that just as hell descends deeper and deeper and deeper, so heaven ascends as we move further up and further in. You've been listening to the Jesus Changes Everything podcast, a production of Dunamis Fellowship, the teaching outreach of Dr. R.C. Sproul Jr. If you've enjoyed this podcast, we encourage you to subscribe, which you can do at all the usual outlets, to tell your friends, and to spread the word. To learn more about the work of Dunamis Fellowship, please visit R.C. Sproul Jr. And join us next time on Jesus Changes Everything.